God is dead. At least that's what a mustachioed madman said over a hundred years ago. He noticed the influence of the church receding being replaced by modern states and ideologies. He was also a bit of a drama queen. Today it might be a stretch to say that God is dead. Squinty-eyed preachers still fill stadiums. We still swear on Bibles and make shoutouts to the big guy all the time. But even all of this is a far cry from a thousand years ago when the Pope ran the world. Today, more people TikTok than they tithe. That said, from our money to our politics, God still comes up all the time. Quite literally. That's a ADBC timeline joke in case, you know, it wasn't exactly clear. This is the timeline of Western philosophy. Hi everyone, I'm Brad and I will be your philosophical shaman tripping you through this hallucination of the Western philosophical tradition. In this episode, we're getting religious. That means we're going to be talking about the big guy upstairs and his early prophets and their impact that they had on philosophy. So whether you're a Jew or Christian or atheist or Hindu or Muslim or just on the fence about everything, the big question that you really should be asking yourself is why should you even care about early religious philosophy? Religion, even if it's a bit out of fashion in the West, still plays a major role in the world. There are billions of believers and for thousands of years, religion dominated philosophy. Even if you don't buy into all the ideas about heaven or hell or the bearded gentleman in the sky, is a good idea. there are so many ideas which are still relevant today. So, if you're religious, keep an open mind to some of these other ideas, and if you're not religious, try to hang with these ideas and themes presented by some of these thinkers. Even if you don't believe in God, the philosophy and genius of these thinkers can still teach you something today. There's a word for what we're talking about. It's called theology. Perhaps it's best we start off with a definition of this word, which brings us to our favorite segment concerning definitions. However, due to the onslaught of litigation continuing to pour in, my lawyers insist we add more disclaimers to this segment. The word theology comes from the Greek root theo, meaning God. Theology is the study or discourse on God. Today we think of theology as something totally separate from the study of the natural world. But for most of the philosophical tradition, theology was a sister pursuit to what we might call sciences today. Plato used the word theology to describe discourse on God in the Republic and Aristotle used it similarly to how we would use metaphysics today. What can we learn about the world by thinking of the divine? Can the study of the supernatural tell us something about the natural? In the ancient world, the study of the gods wasn't quite as prevalent as it would eventually become. It's with the narrowing down of gods that theology really breaks out. So how did the Western world go from paganistic polytheism to the type of religious practices and philosophies more similar to today? Let's begin a little outside the West. In the area surrounding Persia and the Middle East, a religious tradition began to make waves. Known as Zoroastrianism, this new tradition was based on teachings of a prophet known as Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra. 
You might know this name from the popular book written by the God is Dead dude, Frederick Nietzsche, known as Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's also the title to that epic song you know you know, but you just don't know the name of it. Zoroaster is important for many reasons. For one, he's said to have instructed Pythagoras, the triangle guy and mystic who we spoke about previously in episode 2. If you haven't seen that episode, go check it out. And while you're there, you know, like and subscribe and comment and all that. Zoroastrianism also provided a different type of cosmology than the pagan worldview. Zoroastrianism isn't strictly monotheistic, per se, but it did stress the importance of a god of primary importance. This god's name was Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda was responsible for the twin forces of good and evil which were in constant battle and strife within the universe. Fun fact, the religious prophecies concerning the Game of Thrones character Jon Snow is a clear nod to Ahura Mazda. Jon Snow is the Azor Ahai, which is a play on Ahura Mazda and the religion of Zoroastrianism. Like in the Game of Thrones, the struggle between the forces of light and dark ice and fire, would climax in a final reckoning known as whatever this word is. Apocalyptic scenarios take place in all kinds of pagan beliefs. For instance, the Nordics believed in Ragnarok, the final war. But the Zoroastrian reckoning is much similar to the Christian doctrine of Armageddon which followed. This isn't the only influence Zoroaster would have on Christianity. The three wise men of Christian mythology were practitioners of Zoroastrianism, and it's easy to see some of the influence of Zoroaster rubbing off on the idea of Jesus Christ. It's popular on the internet to pretend as if Christ is just a wholesale ripoff of Zoroaster. Some of these claims are dubious, but the fact remains that there are several similarities intentional or otherwise. Okay, so we've been beating around the burning bush here. It's finally time that we bring him up. That's right, the one and only, you've probably heard of him by now, the Son of God himself, Jesus H. Christ. Like Socrates, we have very little record of the historical Jesus. Most of our evidence is from secondhand sources and testimonials written well after the fact. That being said, it's very likely that a guy named Jesus existed. In fact, there could have been several of them. Prophets were popping up at the time faster than the Romans could silence them. To understand the historical Jesus, and particularly why his message was so successful, you really have to understand his time. To get a better sense of the times, let's go to this episode's movie moment. And now for our feature presentation. The Life of Brian is a film about a contemporary of Jesus named Brian. Brian. Brian Cohen. It's your standard messiah story with the wise men. We must see him. We have brought presents. The holy mother. Well, what is man anyway? Crucifixion. Some things in life of man. Beautiful sermons. How blessed are the sorrowful. Roman puns. Biggest diggers. Alien escapes. And much, much more. The film does a good job of showing how commonplace the religious mystic type was at that time but its real strength lies in its portrayal of the time period. More than anything, the times of Jesus were political. The Romans ruled Jewish territories, and despite improvements in civilization, their occupation was not looked on too favorably by the populace. The concept of a messiah, 
of an imminent revolution was an attempt at a spiritual philosophy, but it also had a deeply political undertone. The spiritual message of Jesus had a huge impact on his contemporaries, but it's his political actions, like his cleansing of the temple by driving out the money men, that caught the attention of the Romans and probably are the reason his message became so popular. Jesus didn't necessarily have ambitions to be a revolutionary, but his contemporaries did, and the Romans definitely feared that possibility. So they did what they did. In the years following the death of Jesus, the early Christian leaders began spreading his message. They had quite an uphill battle. Remember, at this time, the world is still overwhelmingly Roman and pagan. Nearly a hundred years after the death of Jesus, there were less than 40,000 Christians in an empire of over 30 million pagans. That said, the teachings of figures like Paul began to take root. Unlike Jesus, who preached primarily to Jews, Paul spent a lot of his time with Gentiles and pagans. Because of this, as well as the martyrdom across the land, Christianity spread faster than the coronavirus. 100 years later, the population would increase by a factor of 30 times. Eventually, the Christian religion would become a dominant force in philosophy. Which brings us to this episode's Philosopher King. Now, you're probably wondering how Jesus, the Son of God, isn't this episode's Philosopher King. Look, Jesus is maybe the most important figure in human history. Definitely top three. And he's the king of heaven and earth for Christ's sake. Let's give someone else the Philosopher King for this episode. That's why the crown must go to the first major philosopher to build on top of early Christian church, St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine was quite the character. He was known to be fun-going and affable, and he might be saintly, but he got around even fathering a child with a mistress. He wrote an amazing autobiography called Confessions, where among many neurotic ramblings, he worries about his wet dreams at night. Oh, excuse me, I mean nocturnal emissions. His personality can be summed up in one of his famous quotes, his plea to God, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. Though, to really understand the philosophy of St. Augustine, we need to first cover the ideas of two others. The first is a man named Manny. You might not know much or anything about Manny and the religion called Manichaeism, but for a period there, it was the primary rival of Christianity for monotheistic beliefs. Manny wanted to unify the major religions of the world and thought of himself as the last prophet in a line that included Zoroaster, Christ, and even Buddha. He had quite a few similarities to Jesus, not least of these being he was tortured to death, but his teachings were even closer to Zoroaster. Manichaeism puts a major emphasis on the world as a clash between good and evil. These two forces, darkness and light, fight until finally the world of light conquers all. This idea was very popular in many areas of the world, particularly those exposed to Zoroastrianism. One of the individuals this was popular with was the early Saint Augustine who practiced the religion for many years before his eventual conversion to Christianity. Augustine began to seriously question Manny's teachings when he came across another branch of philosophy. At this time in the West, a new updated version of Plato's philosophy began to take shape, or should we say, take form. This Neoplatonism was led by a man by the name of Plotinus, the ideas of Augustine of Hippo and Plotinus made quite the pair, what I call Augustine of Hippo Plotinus. Speaking of Hippo Plotinuses, 
it's about time we take a break from all of this heaviness. I know when I'm studying new ideas, I like to take a break from time to time. That's why we have this episode's adorable animal moment. It's with Neoplatonism that Augustine finds solutions to the problems that he encountered in Manichaeism. For starters, to Augustine, the dualism of Mani is untenable. How can two powers both be infinite? If this were the case, then each power would then limit the other. There can only be one infinite power, one god, and he is good. Evil is not some positive force equal in, in opposition to God, but instead the lack of God. Evil is what happens when God's not around. Augustine also had some issues with the materialism of Manichaeism. For Augustine, the higher reality is not just stuff, like matter and the things we can see in the physical world. The ultimate reality is non-physical. This is where Plato really comes into play. Augustine develops a theory of what he calls universals. These are similar to Plato's forms, but where Plato thought we understood forms through a type of recollection, Augustine believed that we grasp the universal through divine illumination. When we understand the universal, we understand the mind of God. Augustine was huge for philosophy. He's the first major thinker since the ancients, and he successfully reinvented Plato's philosophy through the marriage of Neoplatonism and Christianity. Today we like to think of Christianity as this well-established tradition, but in its early days, so many issues were present from the mundane, like whether or not you must be circumcised, all the way to the major questions like the true nature of God. Nothing was totally settled. Augustine's marriage of philosophy and religion is a large reason the church would unify and become so successful. In a world before science, theology was the highest form of trying to understand the world. Augustine, the man with the best, most consistent worldview, provided a coherent vision in a time of chaos. We've barely scratched the surface of early Christian philosophy, but unfortunately we only have so much time. So to get through as much great philosophy as we can, we'll cover it in this episode's Rapid Fire. Rapid Fire. We cover as much philosophy as we can in the time allotted. Counter set? Go. Christians have long puzzled over the concept of original sin. Is man born tainted with sin? What does original sin even mean? Augustine fought the rival theory by Pelagius, who claimed that man had equal capacity for good or evil, regardless of original sin. Augustine disagreed. He thought original sin greatly hindered our will to do good, burdening us with bodily desires. Put a sinful choice side by side a good choice and see what the average person picks. Augustine was also an ardent opposer of slavery. He led the movement against slavery, which was very common at his time. Depressing factoid, Christian emperors allowed the sale of children not because they were particularly fond of the practice, but as a way of preventing infanticide when parents were unable to care for a child. So that's depressing. The philosophical legacy of Christ, the early church, and Augustine is still felt today. This burgeoning theological trend helped revive the philosophy of the ancients, 
particularly the philosophy of Plato. It progressed a platonic worldview. You initially have Plato in his school of ideas, then Aristotle comes and responds. It's with the Christian philosophy that you have new thinkers such as Augustine working out the contradictions of the ancient philosophy of not only Plato, but also Aristotle's response to Plato. Augustine has us return to Plato, but a new Plato that has some of the inconsistencies worked out with the ideas of God. Augustine has us return to Plato, but not just the same old Plato from the past. It's a new Plato which is able to resolve and confront some of the contradictions and objections proposed by Aristotle and some of the later philosophers that followed Plato. In the next episode, we'll see this evolution and trend continue. If this age, the age of the religious prophets, was an age dominated by Plato, then certainly the next age is one dominated by Aristotle. So I've had a few comments in this series about suggesting books or articles or anything on these topics that we cover in these episodes, kind of like a further reading. It was something I originally wanted to add and I was just afraid that nobody would care <laughs> what I suggested to read. And so going forward, I'd like to add a few at the end of each episode. For this episode, most of the time at, for beginners, it, you don't recommend kind of jumping into some of the harder actual source material. But I think if you are going to read anything from this time, you have to read Augustine's Confessions. You know, it's not too terribly large of a book. And, I'll, you know, I'll be the first to admit I haven't sat down and just read the whole thing, right? But reading passages of it are amazing. It's all around just really bizarre, to be quite honest. But clearly a work of, you know, brilliance. So if I had to recommend just one book, it would be The Confessions of St. Augustine.